Well, thank you so much for doing this, Ambassador. Um, I thought I would start with um, a question having to do with sort of with the, the 30,000 foot view. It's the 75th anniversary of the United Nations, uh, an organization that was started with the loftiest of, of ambitions, uh, in part to prevent uh, interstate conflict, but also to promote basic democratic values. Um, when I interviewed your predecessor, Nikki Haley, at the end of 2018, she said that the verdict was still out whether uh, the United Nations and the U.S. participation in the United Nations still served U.S. interests. I wanted to get your percept, your your view on this question uh, now that you've been in the job. Um, so what do you think? Um, has the U.N. lived up to its um, founding principles? And do you, st do you think the organization and U.S. participation in the organization serves American interests? You know, thank you, Eli, for that question. If we weren't uh, having a monsoon rain, I would walk the uh, iPad over so you could see my view of the East River and the UN compound that I see every morning when I, when I wake up and, and come into the main room. I can't imagine looking from the 37th floor of my residence and not seeing the UN compound and that not being here in New York City in the United States of America. And I think it's really important that the institution is located in New York, it's located in the United States because that gives the U.S. the opportunity as the host country to be able to be face-to-face -face with like-minded countries and with countries that we don't see eye-to-eye -eye with so that we can shine a light on them. I mean, can you imagine the U.N. not being located here and perhaps being located in China? Um, I have read what the predecessors have, have, have all said and and you know, yes, it is discouraging at times. Um, uh, you know, we, we are discouraged at times that people do not always see the founding principles of the UN Charter. But at the same time, that is what we are here to do, is to promote our founding fathers, to promote the 75th anniversary, 1948, we signed the UN Charter. Um, it's funny enough that in 1971, China of all countries reaffirmed their commitment to the UN Charter and the UN Declaration of Human Rights. So I can't imagine the UN being located anywhere and I'm hoping that I can build upon my predecessors and uh, not necessarily have affection, but have gained respect and the continuing to shine a light on countries that abuse the rights of others. Um, just following up on that, um, certainly the Trump administration, but before that, um, George W. Bush, and, and there's a long tradition of American ambassadors being very frustrated with UN bureaucracy and seeking reform. Can you talk a little bit now about uh, the reform agenda and, and how much you've accomplished in that re regard? How, how do you approach reforming the U United Nations, which I think was the first, in, in, in Trump's first address to the United Nations General Assembly in 2017, he made a, a big point to sort of say that you can't live up to these principles without reform. So can you sort of fill us in on sort of what you've been doing in this regard? Absolutely. Well, you know, I go back to, to my predecessors and, and Ambassador Kirkpatrick and the fact that she first acknowledged that there was waste and that we needed to reform the United Nations. And then I go to Negroponte who took upon her words and her opening the doors for us to be able to reform and to, to actually, you know, acknowledge the fact that the institution needs a lot of help. We need to institute transparency, accountability. We need to you know, carve out areas where there's a lot of waste, financial waste. We have a, a, an obligation to the American taxpayers to not only modernize the, the secretariat and the, and the UN as an institution, but to hold them accountable for our dollars and for the tax dollars of the countries, the contributing countries. And as you well know, we are the largest contributor to the United Nations. And I just think it's important to build upon my predecessors and to make certain that we hold them accountable. And because accountability only results in, in actions that are going to initiate positive reinforcement of the United Nations. How, how do you hold, um... Uh, UN bodies that are answerable to, to other nations or for that matter international institutions accountable what are what are some of the ways that you think you the United States can do that well I think I think first and foremost we have to really focus on um, implementing more Americans within the UN system within the secretariat and I 
and not only just Americans, but like-minded countries. Because as in UNICEF and the World Food Program, when you have Americans that are the directors at the helm of organizations, you have accountability, you have transparency. And I think until we are able to, to place more Americans and like-minded countries within the system, there's always that question of, of are they being fully transparent? Are our tax dollars being used according to the mandate, whether it's a peacekeeping mission or any of the NGOs for that matter. Um, so that is for, for and first, you know, foremost. And I think we need to also really pull in public-private partnerships within the UN system, because I can tell you that the private enterprises, the private, you know, industry, private individuals are going to demand transparency and they're gonna demand accountability. And, you know, we, we will pull out of, of organizations where we don't think that our funding is being used appropriately as we have shown in the past, and we will continue to do so. And I think it's only important for all the member states to demand transparency and accountability for, the, for their taxpayers as well. Well, this dovetails into my next question, which is about um, Secretary of State Pompeo has um, you know, really had a, almost a, a public awareness campaign about um, what he would say would be this sort of um, the uh, predations of the Chinese Communist Party. And a big focus of that has been on the UN international organizations and trying to make, uh, trying to compete um, for the leadership and also key personnel in these organizations. In some cases, like the World Health Organization, President Trump has pulled out. Um, can you give us a sense of where that campaign is right now? Um, and, and what are some of the successes? And in your view, where is there room for improvement? You know, Eli, let's go back to 2016 during President Trump's campaign. This was one of his platforms, is really shining a light on China, whether it is China uh, stealing from our economy, our intellectual property. You know, it's all been about China. And this is just a, a continuation of the president's platform. The secretary is, is every day we are shining a light on the way that China is behaving, whether it be through the WHO, I mean, the United States has been the largest contributor of WHO, and basically that's been to be a mouthpiece for China. And so therefore, that's why we withdrew from the WHO. You know, we are working very hard on different organizations within the UN during elections like WIPO, the intellectual property, to make sure that the Chinese, that their candidate does not win. Because the more people that we can have within the UN system that are either Americans or like-minded countries, the more transparency and the more that we are able to really shine a light on China. And it is daily that they are abusing the rights of others or abusing the UN system. You know, they are increasing their contributions and it's really to manipulate the system. It's not in order to, to lift up other countries as the US, as our number one priority is at the UN. It is to manipulate through the system their own agenda. And, you know, the General Secretary Xi and the Communist Party of China want to bring in their ideals and want to bring in their people. We cannot allow this to happen. And in every day that I'm in the council, we will be shining a light on China and other countries that also are abusing the rights of others and abusing the system. Well, you know, on that point, um, we know that um, there's been some public, some very good public reporting on how China conducts its own diplomacy. They uh, can get very personal and offer bribes. They can offer countries uh, loans. They can do all kinds of things to try to secure votes in these international organizations for Chinese chosen uh, leaders and other things like that. What, tell me about how the United States does its counter diplomacy in this regard. Do we play a similar kind of hardball? You know, I don't think we need to play hardball. I think that that with every day that we shine a light on China within the council or from Washington, from the administration, mm -hmm. that that is allowing the member states to see that China may come in and, and offer help, but they're also offering ownership. So they come in with these shiny projects, have visibility, and it's low return. And if you look no further than the continent of Africa, I think they are now becoming very tuned in to the fact that when China comes in, they take with them more than they leave. And that's what's important about the U.S. is when we arrive in a country, whether it be the, the states in Africa, Latin America, the Pacific Islands, the Caribbean, 
we leave with communities intact. We leave with the building up of communities, of families, of the economy, of sustainability. And that's what we're focused on. I think more important, we provide actions. We're not about lip service. But it, when you were doing your diplomacy with various ambassadors and so forth, I mean, walk, I don't know how much you can say. I know that diplomacy often is, uh, has to be done discreetly, but just kind of walk us through. Like, is that, is that the argument that you make that, you know, China's not your long-term interest? Is it all based on principles? Or are there things that are going to be tangible uh, to smaller countries that choose to vote with the United States? I mean, it certainly wouldn't be the first time the U.S. has done that kind of thing. And I'm not casting aspersions on it, but I just want to get a sense of how that works on the, on the nitty gritty level. I think, I think what, what my, the, way, the way I choose to, uh, mm -hmm. to my daily interaction is building relationships with some of the smaller countries, regardless of the fact of their relationship with China, because what we have to do is show them action. I have to show them interest in their country and in their needs. And then I will take it to the administration, whether it be to the development you know, areas of the, of the administration where we can come in and help build most importantly, help build them sustainable communities. Um, when I first arrived, I took a lot of the um, acknowledgement from George H.W.'s book and how he arrived at the UN and reached out to the smaller countries and he himself went to visit them, as did Ambassador Negroponte. Um, I did the same thing. And until COVID-19, um, I was seeing them face to face. During COVID time, I used those, those months to actually reach out via text and phone to the other member states and just to have a conversation. They need to be listened to. They need to be acknowledged that they matter. Uh, the votes come later. I think when you develop that relationship, you don't have to ask for the vote because you have the ground floor. When you ask someone for a vote and you don't have that relationship built, I mean, th these are smart people. They're, they're here for a reason. They're here because they are the cream of the crop of their diplomats. And I want them to understand that we respect that and that their relationship matters to me. The vote will come later. Hmm. Um, I want to move on to the Middle East. Um, as you know, and I'm sure you've been working on, um, I guess in October, the uh, UN conventional arms embargo will uh, sunset with regards to Iran. Um, this has been a high priority for Brian Hook, who I think will be addressing the forum uh, later. Um, and I think it's a high priority for a lot of US allies in the region to make sure that that uh, arms embargo remains. So at this point, uh, do you think you will be able to persuade China and Russia not to veto uh, a new resolution at this point? That would extend. You know, at this point, obviously this is very crucial at any point, but yeah. at this moment we have a choice. We have a choice between freedom and tyranny. Uh, we have an obligation to protect the Arab countries, to protect Israel, to protect the European countries. Russia and China, they too do not want Iran to have the access to nuclear weapons. We all are aware that this is a very rogue regime. You need to look no further than just the way they treat their own people. And we want to protect the Iranian people. We want to protect people in Yemen, Syria, Libya, Lebanon, Venezuela. I can go on and on at where this rogue regime is going in and only adding fuel to these little fires that they have set themselves. Um, I think it's really important that um, we started early because this is obviously a very crucial issue that will affect the world for generations to come. Um, China and Russia have threatened to veto. Yes, that's accurate. However, I also know that they understand that this is, there's a choice here. And this is a choice that they will have to make. They will have blood on their hands. Um, they also understand that we have a council that feel very um, adamantly about their choice of freedom. And this is an issue that Brian Hook, the secretary and myself have been working on in reaching out to the countries, especially the Security Council countries. Brian, who will be speaking with, on, on Aspen Institute tomorrow, will be able to speak more technically. However, what I have been doing is reaching out to the perm reps on the Security Council and just you know, re-emphasizing the importance that there's a choice here between freedom and tyranny. And, and 
this is a choice that's going to affect millions of people around the world. And I think everyone understands that fully. Is the strategy to, to persuade the Chinese and the Russians to change their mind, or is it to isolate them on the Security Council to show that, yes, they may have to use their veto, but you want to try to get as, I'm assuming France, the United Kingdom, the other uh, veto-wielding members and others uh, on your side of it. I mean, is the strategy that you think that there is some diplomacy to be done that maybe will get them not to exercise the veto, or do you just want to isolate them at this point? I mean, I think the strategy in the perfect world would always be to have them abstain and or obviously not veto. Okay. However, let's be realistic here. Yeah. Um, right now, the strategy is working with the other members of the Security Council and making certain that we really, just as we did in Syria with the cross-border issue, put them in a corner and shine the light on them. Because, you know, this is a choice, and everyone is going to know this is a choice between tyranny and freedom. And we will allow the world to see the choice that China and Russia will make, um, just as we did with the cross-border issues in Syria. I mean, 13 of us gathered together. We became one. We, we were adamant about keeping the border issue in Syria, as we will be about promoting freedom and keeping the regime, this rogue regime in Iran, from affecting the many countries that they already are engaged in and by protecting the freedom and security of Israel and the Arab countries. So if I could just push back a little bit, it seems, maybe I'm getting it wrong, but it seems to me that you're saying that you're sort of trying to morally almost shame the Chinese and the Russians and saying, if you choose to stand by this, then blood will be on your hands. But do you think that shame works with Russia which has been Assad's air force since 2015 um, with China that is conducting this campaign with, with you know, what have been called concentration camps against the Uyghurs uh, in the Xinjiang province. These are, you know, kind of, you could say great powers that seem to not have many moral considerations. Why do you think that shame would work or they would care given their history of voting uh, in the past on these kinds of things? You know, I think it's, a, it, it's really important to, to show the other member states okay. who also are, this, this is an area, this happens to be a topic where it's going to affect the world. And we yeah. have made it very clear within the, the UN system to all of the member states, not only to the Security Council, and as you know, the Secretary and the President, this is their priority, is showing to the world that we are here to protect the freedom of the Iranian people, to protect the, the Middle East, Israel, and, and yes, they're, they're, you know, Russia and China are going to be who they are. I'm not going to be able to change their mind. However, what we can do is change the way that other countries look to them and look at them. And that's what's important. And honestly, there's a choice here. And, and, and my job is to make certain that we hold accountable Russia and China and that we truly shine a light on them. And if we don't shame them, who is going to shame them? Who is going to stand up to China's propaganda, to Russia's propaganda? This is what the Americans do. This is why the American ambassador is so important within the UN system. And also in hope that we have the like-minded countries that stand with us because there's more power when we're all together, especially within the UN system. Now, if I, if I could turn it around, and I'm, I'm here kind of in a journalistic capacity, so I want to make, yes. make it clear this is not my view, but I think there would be plenty of people who would sort of say, what standing does the United States under President Trump have to make these moral arguments? The United States unilaterally took out Qasem Soleimani in, ba in uh, Baghdad airport. The United States unilaterally withdrew in 2018 from the Iran nuclear deal. Why is the United States lecturing other countries on sort of morality and statecraft at the United Nations? What's your, I'm sure you encounter this, but what is your response to that kind of argument? You know, it, it, we have an obligation as Americans because we are a country that we were founded upon democracy, the rule of law. We have an obligation to, to really um, use every tool in our toolbox to call out rogue regimes to be able to protect the citizens of these countries of rogue regimes, the Iranian people, the uh, people in Syria from this Assad regime. You know, you realize Iran is propping up the Assad regime. They're in Yemen, they're Libya, Lebanon, Venezuela. I mean, they are 
the reason for so many atrocities, not only to their own people, but around the world. And with the founding principles of the UN, we have an oath, we took an oath, we have an obligation to promote freedom and democracy, peace and security around the world. Okay, I mean, I, 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 I certainly agree with that, but I'm just saying, how would you respond to saying, well, you know, the United States has acted unilaterally, um, it, you know, it has taken these steps in Iraq against, as I said before, in Qasem Soleimani. Um, so, you know, there is an argument, uh, it's very popular, you know, even in this country, a lot of people think that Trump has sort of acted himself at times as a rogue leader and so forth. I just want to know how you kind of encounter, when you encounter that at Turtle Bay, what do you say? You know, my response is that this president cares first about the safety and security of the American people. Right. Um, we are on a world stage. We are the leader of the free world. The president has been, he ran on this in 2016 and calling out rogue regimes in, first of all, mining our own people and building up our own, our, our economy, our defense, um, building America, and we can then take what we have built upon and make certain that we implement this around the world. You know, I do hear this frequently, but I will tell you there is no one who is a better defender of democracy and the rule of law in the world than President Trump and Secretary Pompeo. And I am not, I will never apologize for our mannerisms. And I am telling you now, when daily, when the UN fails to promote democracy, I'm going to do whatever it takes to defend democracy. Hmm. Okay, um, moving on, I want to talk a little bit about um, what can the United Nations and particularly the Security Council do in regards to Venezuela? Um, we know that Nicolas Maduro has um, called for what appear will probably be, will almost certainly be sham elections in December. Um, can you talk a little bit about the role for the UN to play in the transition to democracy for Venezuela? You know, as you know, as you well know, the United States and several other member states support Guaido and support yeah. his presidency. We also support the National Assembly. The, the US has been the largest contributor to humanitarian aid in the Latin America countries. You know, I was just in Colombia uh, before COVID and saw firsthand the hundreds of thousands of refugees that are crossing over to, into Latin America, especially into Colombia. So you have human rights that are being abused in Venezuela. The people are traveling, especially into Colombia because of, obviously of the proximity. So what we have been able to do is to offer humanitarian aid and support to the Latin America countries because before COVID, before the migration, this was an issue just within their own countries in, in, the, in their health issues, their economy, and then to have this compound upon what already was occurring. So, you know, it is really important that we help Latin America that we uncover all the atrocities of the Maduro regime. Obviously, once again, Iran is engaged in propping up the Maduro regime. Um, this is a very evil actor who has absolutely no respect for the people of Venezuela. And as the ambassador to the, U you know, to the UN, the US has to represent what is the right thing to do. And that is to call out the Maduro regime by supporting Guaido and by supporting his people for free and fair elections. And we have to really stress that the UN and the Council, the Security Council, the Human Rights Council, any council cannot cover up for the Maduro regime. Have you, uh, do you have any specifics on in how you think, have UN bureaucracies covered up for the Maduro regime? Well, we have, can't bring this before the Security Council. And if you look right. at, at the Human Rights Council, which allows Venezuela, I mean, what more, proof do I have that the United Nations system has yet to abide by the original charter? Well, and the, the we UN Rapporteur for, for Venezuela, Ms. Albacale, just came out with, I thought, a devastating report, I think last month, on uh, human rights abuses in Venezuela. I thought it was just absolutely, it was, it was horrific to read, but it was, I thought it pulled no punches. You know, and of all people to come out to write a report right. in addressing human rights abuses in Venezuela, then Michelle Bachelet, I can't imagine why if other countries right. did not take heed and read her report, 
I don't know, you know, how else I can say that it is far important that we continue to, to really uncover this Maduro regime, because if she cannot, and she is someone that was very surprising that, as you well know, that came out with this report, yes, we can welcome this all day long in Latin America, but we all feel the same. What we have to do is continue calling out, and I will continue trying to call AOBs on Venezuela within the Security Council. I mean, we have to take the like-minded countries who are, you know, recognizing the Guaido regime and continue to lift him up and to really stress to him the importance of free and fair elections and support them for this. And also to make certain that we don't forget the Latin American countries who are under this heavy burden right now on top of COVID-19, taking in all of the refugees coming in from Venezuela. This is a disaster. I mean, you have Iran, you have Russia, you have China, Cuba. We have so many countries lifting them up. And if, you know, that's a really good uh, little circle of friendship there. If you think about all the friends they have, they're all just such rogue regimes. And they're all the same right. country that the U.S. is constantly using every tool in our toolbox to stop mm. the abuses, just, you know, by our sanctions, whatever tools we have to be able to stop what they are doing to prevent democracy and the rule of law for their people. Um, you mentioned, and briefly, and then we'll get to some questions, but you mentioned the UN Human Rights Council. The United States is not on the UN Human Rights Council, sort of on principle. Um, but can you, is there any hope that the UN Human Rights Council will, will really, you know, at least begin to, dis, to not allow members that are horrific human rights abusers uh, to serve under it? Or is that just what's going to happen because of the nature of regional voting and such? You know, I mean, there's a reason that we're no longer on there. Can you imagine a council that, that allows the Democratic Republic of Congo to be a member? I mean, we don't need to be a member of the Human Rights Council. If you just read Secretary Pompeo every day calling out China with the way they treat the Uyghurs, with the way they treat Africans, with look at Hong Kong, Taiwan, be the way they're treating the Tibetans, we will continue without being a member of the Human Rights Council to shine a light on those countries. And you know, if you look at the members of that council, why would you wanna be part of a group that is abusing their own people? We have far more effectiveness if we are calling them out outside that council so that we can really shine a light what's going on with them. Okay, I think now's the time where there, we, uh, we're going to open it up for the last 15 minutes for some questions, if people want to sure. raise their hands. Um, so let's just, hopefully this will get working. Um, it's a little bit technical. Um, in the interim, I mean, I'd love to ask kind of a personal question. When you took this job, did yes. you call uh, prior um, U.S. ambassadors to the United Nations, and have you, you know, had a relationship with Nikki Haley or Susan Rice or Samantha Power? I mean, can you talk a little bit about that? Absolutely. You know what? One of the first, of the first, obviously, mm -hmm. Nikki and I spoke the very first thing. We got yeah. together and spent several hours. But I, ha I had uh, lunch with Susan Rice, and she was very open about refugees and, and areas in Africa that she thought I could be very helpful because she understands my uh, initiative for public-private partnership in Africa on a personal level. Um, and Samantha Powers, I have not met with her. I, I have read her book as I did George H.W.'s and spoken to Ambassador Negroponte, um, Ambassador Kirkpatrick. So what I've tried to do is take all of the, the positive approaches from my predecessors and build upon those because I'm hoping that from their, their, their good policy, you know, there's nothing wrong with building upon good policy, then I will leave this stronger and that my successors will also then have something that they even have a, a, a more solid platform. Um, you know, I am very much interested in the um, situation in the African states. That's a, that's a very private, personal initiative of my own. And it was nice to talk with, with Ambassador Rice because that she too felt the same way. Samantha Powers um, also with several of her publications has stressed refugees and also stressed the importance of having relationships with the smaller countries. And that is something also that George H.W. did really well. And so I've tried to take everybody's um, advice and use a little bit of it to suit my own personality. 
and mm. it's really worked well. So thanks for that question. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you, so you had a lunch with Susan Rice? Yeah, so she, I did. Is she vice presidential material? You know, this was last year. I think she's just one of the, the smartest women. She was very helpful to me. Uh, if you can imagine uh, people walking by us in the restaurant, mm. you know, looking at the both of us at lunch. I can imagine, yeah. But I, I walked away, you know, better knowledge on refugees and areas where I was best suited to help. Um, and that's from my conversation with her was really related to, to the UN and how, what an impact that the US UN, UN ambassador has within the UN system and that to take advantage of the moment. And, you know, she also said, make certain to enjoy yourself. So that was really oh, good. That's nice. Yeah. That's nice. That's, Thank that's you. Nice. you know, I read, I read some of the comments when you had interviewed Ambassador Haley and, and right. different people and, and the fact that we don't have an Ambassador Bolton and you leave without affection. You know, it's not a popularity contest here. Sure. What it is, is making certain that, that I am privileged to have a sneak peek into the, the real the heart of some of the countries that, we normally would not be able to, to have that opportunity. And so with that comes the responsibility. And so when I leave here, I will still carry that responsibility to carry the message of countries that this is their only platform. And like I said to you, when I look out on the East River and I see this, this huge compound, these 38 floors, I think about the small countries that really depend upon this compound as their only platform. So, you know, it's up to us to really shine the light on the, on the abuses and to make certain that we uphold the charter. Um, we are the leader of the free world. We are the largest contributor. And, you know, we have an obligation to really hit hard and hit back at the countries who do not follow the UN Charter. Mm. Thank you so much, Ambassador Kraft, for those. We have a lot of people interested, the oh, attendees, good. in asking questions. And Eli, if you're ready, uh, maybe we'll go to Lori Garrett from the Council on Foreign Relations. Great. As so, are you hearing me? Yes, yes. Lori, we hear uh, you. Because as it may go to understanding your technology problems, as soon as you said my name, you logged me out of the <laughs> system. <laughs> and I had to log back in entirely to Zoom. So, oops. Um, quick question. Uh, can you, Ambassador Kraft, tell us what actually is the strategic thinking in the Trump administration regarding how we will end this pandemic? And in particular, how does that go to your role um, in the Security Council and in relation to the multilateral system to come up with some shared sense of solutions and strategic plan? You know, thanks for that question. I think it's really important right now to understand that with, I'm gonna go back to March with the Secretary General in his global call for the ceasefire. I think that has been really important, especially during COVID because we have to have this ceasefire in order to, to safely allow the frontline workers you know, we already have humanitarian aid in, for existing situations going on in Yemen and Syria and other places in Latin America, other places around the world. But the global ceasefire that was initiated with the Secretary General has allowed us at this time to really um, mitigate this process, this COVID-19, because there's a lot of humanitarian aid that is yet to be able to be delivered because we had situations of conflict on the ground. Um, as far as domestically, you know, the president has, has been a leader in our country speaking about COVID-19, but it is also a responsibility of each of us to be responsible for ourselves and follow the guidelines. And also we have a responsibility for those people that are either next to us or in our own homes. So I take it as responsibility upon myself. And I really stress this, you know, when I was in uh, Turkey and I, and I could see, I, I saw the border, I saw the Turkish side with the Syrian refugees, and you look over the border and you see the difference when you do have a system that, that actually you know, demands people to follow guidelines. And when you look over into Syria and you see, can you imagine being a Syrian refugee on the Syrian side and being asked to shelter in place and you're already in such a small area that there is no sheltering in place by yourself, there is no social distancing, 
if you're a mother in one of these refugee camps and you have several children and you have a choice between purchasing a bar of soap or feeding your children, if we can't get the humanitarian aid for simple supplies like soap, then you have to forego that in order to feed your children. So it is really important right now, especially during COVID-19, especially in areas of conflict that they maintain this global ceasefire. As you know, the UN Security Council, we just also had our resolution on the global ceasefire, and that has allowed us more humanitarian aid, more humanitarian workers. It's protected uh, the pregnant women coming from Syria over the border to be able to give birth, the ones coming in from Venezuela into Colombia. I mean, the global ceasefire has really helped to protect those in need, especially in COVID-19. And then another area that really concerns me at the moment is we are all so focused on, on COVID as we should be around the world that we can't forget that there are simple vaccinations that children are not, that our infants and children are not receiving because we are really focused on COVID. So we really need to remember that they already have situations before COVID that we need to also serve and make sure that our humanitarian aid and, and the, the medicine and supplies are reaching the situations and the diseases that were there before COVID. You're absolutely right on the other vaccinations. And we're gonna hear from Lori Garrett actually later on in the program, I think on Thursday. Uh, we now have a question from Charlie Dunlap. And questioners, just hold on. It'll go dark for a second and then you'll be promoted mm -hmm. to panelist. No need to log back in. Charlie Dunlap. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Ambassador. I'm Charlie Dunlap, a retired Air Force Major General, now speak, uh, teaching at Duke Law School. I would like to follow up on something that Mr. Lake raised, and that was the Human Rights Council. And specifically, recently, there was a report by the special rapporteur who generally condemned drones, but specifically alleged that the U.S. strike uh, on Soleimani was illegal under international law. And my question then is, uh, do you have any comment on that? But specifically, I'd be interested to know if other, what other nations have said to you about the strike and whether they're supportive of the United States or not. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, you know, Soleimani was planning and had planned several attacks on U.S. military and on our like-minded allies. This is a rogue regime. This is a regime that has that promotes bloodshed. This is a regime that executes its own people. This is a regime, I mean, I can go on and on. The Iranian regime is propping up Assad. This is a, 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 a dictator who uses chemical weapons against his own people. I mean, they are propping up the Houthi rebels in Yemen. They're in Libya. I mean, they're in Lebanon. We are going to go after any player in any regime that is harming American military and personnel. And he, Soleimani, wrecked havoc on a daily basis. And we are not for one minute, we are, going, we are going to use every tool we have to take down people that are not allowing human lives and that are exploiting others. I mean, this is a rogue regime. Soleimani was part of it. And we, we know for a fact, and I will tell you that there were, was several countries that just had a sigh because they too know that by Soleimani not, no longer being here, it helps save their countries. So privately, other ambassadors of the UN told you that they approved of the strike, but they wouldn't say that publicly, is that right? Well, I have ambassadors come up to, come up to me you know, obviously before COVID, when I was at the UN mm -hmm. on a daily basis, that would thank America for the fact that we are in, in different ways keeping their country safe. Um, whether it be through the Security Council resolutions, whether it be just through statements from President Trump, people understand the importance of the fact that America takes the lead on protecting people across around the world. So yes. So if, I could do, if, I, if I could just maybe sharpen or follow up on Char, um, Charlie Dunlap's sure. point. I, I, isn't there an <laughs> argument that says that part of the point of the UN is to have every country uh, adhere to the same set of rules? And if the United States takes the position that anywhere there's an individual that is a threat to it, it reserves the right to use 
a drone and lethal force, well, there would be kind of global chaos and war if every country acted like the United Nations. And I'm not saying that I necessarily believe that, but I think that's the argument. Can, can you respond to that, that why America kind of has maybe a right to be exceptional in this regard? You know, we wouldn't even be having this conversation if every country also adhered and abided by the UN Charter. I mean, let's sure. start back from 75 years ago with the Charter in 1948. If everybody adhered and, and, you know, and upheld this Charter with human rights and, and freedom of democracy and freedom of speech, we wouldn't have to take the measures that we take. But I will tell you that any time an American is in harm's way, it's American troops, American personnel, we are going to take measures that is going to mitigate that situation, whether it is take that person out, whatever it takes, there will not be American military service men and women and American personnel in harm's way under the Trump administration. And if we can't get the UN to act upon it together, we will do this alone. Understood. I think we have time for one more question and that's from C. Young Kim. And then I wanna give Ambassador Kraft and Eli just a minute to close it out. C. Young Kim. possible that we lost them. So maybe I'll just turn to you, Ambassador Kraft, with one last question. And oh, can you hear me now? And now we can hear you. Great. Oh, sorry. Thank you. It's an honor to have a chance. So in terms of North Korea, I want to have a question that it's been two, over the two years uh, we're discussing the North Korean problem in the United Nations. So uh, I want to ask you the perspective of viewers uh, toward the North Korean problem, including the some mm -hmm. sanction and some nuclear threat as well. So, which is preferred, some pressure or some diplomatic ways? Which is your preferred method? I want to ask that. Thank you. You know, our preferred method is whatever tool that works in order to protect a, the, the, the people in North Korea and the region around North Korea. I mean, we have an obligation, and as President Trump, as you well know, and, and as his meeting, meetings with Chairman Kim, we, they, we are very clear about our expectations of denuclearizing, of de-weaponizing, of making certain that the region around North Korea, and it is a, a daily discussion. It is something that we keep a, a very close eye on. Um, as you've heard the news today, it is something that um, is, is we take very serious and we are very concerned about. I hope I understood your question correctly. If I didn't, you can repeat it. Thank you very much. Eli, do you want to say a last few words? Well, I want to thank the ambassador so much for doing this. Uh, I certainly learned a lot. I hope that uh, everyone else did. And uh, I know it's not easy to sort of take all these kind of questions in a Zoom format from all different regions of the world, but I think you did a great job. So thanks so much for your time on that. Do you have anything you want to say, Ambassador? You know, I just want to thank the Aspen Institute and for, for actually all the media, because without the media, shining a light on what was happening with the refugees in Syria. I don't know that we would have had the 12 month border, the 12 month mandate, because without the media really showing all of these graphic images of, of children and women uh, during the winter months, um, we might've just had a six month mandate. And so I, I have to really, um, I owe it a tremendous gratitude for people reporting accuracy, for uh, having myself and other people before me today and tomorrow for being interviewed because I think each of us will leave just a nugget of information and of truth that um, the listeners can take. And it's just really important that we have institutes like the Aspen Institute that has people from, from all walks of the political spectrum and from all the beliefs. So I really appreciate the fact that you've allowed me to continue to shine this light on China um, you can come to me tomorrow or next year, and I'm going to be continuing the same light until we finally show the world the human rights abuses that are happening inside China. And we owe it to the Uyghurs. We owe it to the Africans. We owe it to the people in Hong Kong, the Hong Kongers that have fought for democracy. And every day I'm going to be talking about what's happening in China and also shining a light on Russia 
So you can better believe that I'm happy they're in the Security Council because that gives me the, the opportunity when in person to be able to have that dialogue and say, you know what, we're on to you. We, we know what you're doing and there's not for one second that the U.S. is going to stand by and let this happen. Thank you very much, Thank Ambassador you. Kraft. Thank you, Eli Lake, for this excellent interview. And, and thanks for, for shouting this out. This is exactly what we're trying to do as the Aspen Institute, have different viewpoints, international viewpoints, U.S. viewpoints, and we're strictly bipartisan, and we're very grateful to have you here. So thank you very much.